how's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we're looking at the very trippy Daniel Isn't Real, where we follow Luke, a troubled young man, who after suffering a violent family trauma, resurrects his childhood imaginary friend to help him cope. The friend Daniel helps Luke to achieve his dreams and grow before pushing him into a desperate fight for his own soul. The bad imaginary friend idea is almost its own subgenre of horror films, as the concept has been done several times previously. But Daniel Isn't Real stands out for putting its own very unique spin on things. From a purely production standpoint, it's extremely visually slick, and the score provided by electronic artist Clark is suitably moody and tense. All that is great, but the real core of the movie is the evolving dynamic of our two main characters, Luke and his imaginary friend Daniel. It's an extremely complex relationship that is constantly developing into new directions that really peels back the layers of who Luke is, and how much he in a way needs Daniel. Of course, this turns out to be a dangerous relationship, and it's exciting to see how things play out. Our lead, Miles Robbins, as the twitchy, brooding Luke is good, but the real delight here is Patrick Schwarzenegger. Yep, Arnold's kid, that gives a standout performance. Then there's the ending that takes things into a very surprising direction. Of course, the big question is all about is Daniel real or not? And the answer we get is definitely unexpected. So let's dive into the many questions at hand in Daniel Isn't Real, breaking down the story as well as Luke's important journey, just what Daniel is exactly, and explaining the ending and what it means. There's a mass of colorful, swirling space clouds, flashing lights of thunder are heard, along with strange roaring. In a cafe, a barista is singing to your customers, seeming as though it's a normal day like any other. That is, until someone comes barging in with a gun and blows everyone away. Elsewhere, little Luke overhears his parents in a heated argument, and based on what we overhear, it sounds like his mom has some lingering mental health issues that have returned to the surface. Her husband wants her to get treatment, but she flips out, decrying doctors, and smashes a bunch of stuff. He takes a walk outside, stumbling upon a crime scene, and easily limbos under the tape barricade, catching a glimpse of a dead body covered in blood. Out of nowhere, another kid appears asking if he wants to play. The two become fast friends, playing make-believe together, but his mom isn't so happy, chiding him for running away. Starting to pull him away, he asks if Daniel can come along. She doesn't know who that is, and leans down to the air, inviting him to dinner. They have a mighty battle, using brooms in place of swords, and do other silly little kid things, like constructing his mom an origami tea set, as she's been sad lately. The kids are back to playing make-believe, but we now see their imagination come to life. The brooms are now swords for real, and the environment changes to resemble that of a castle's stone walls. Mom comes in, seeing he is indeed playing by himself, meaning Daniel isn't real, or at least can't be seen by anyone else. She carries him to a mirror, and tries to convince him, as well as herself, that the two of them are gonna be just fine. Daniel comes up with a cool idea, going right for the meds drawer. Luke asks what they are. Dan smirking, they'll give your mom superpowers, and pours them right into a smoothie. Whatever it was has made Claire quite ill, weakly calling for her son. She painfully crawls into his room, grunting his name, and finds the pill bottle, moaning, why did you do this to me? He immediately blames Daniel, and she's had enough. No more Daniel. The plan is to lock him up in grandma's dollhouse, handing over a key. He tells Daniel that he did something bad, and screams over and over to get in. Inside the house, lights flicker to life, and Daniel appears in the kind of other world version of the house, banging at the door to get out. Luke puts the key in the lock, as the banging continues, and he somberly walks away. That's the end of Daniel, at least for now. We then pick up several years later with Luke at college age, sitting alone and scribbling in a notebook, watching people from the roof of the building. He calls his mom, who is wondering when he'll come home to visit, but tells him to not come home just because he doesn't like school. Maybe he just needs some friends. His roommate shows off a picture of some girl, him unsure if he wants to bang or worship her, showing us that perhaps the pool of possible friends around here ain't exactly that enticing. The apartment now looks much darker, and there's papers plastered all over the walls and on the floors, illustrating his mother's decaying, frazzled mental state. He finds her amongst more papers, busy cutting words off of a page. He inquires what it is she's working on, and she stammers that sometimes the words speak to me. The messages in the books. Well, what about the mirror? Seeing that it's all scraped up, and Claire casually tells him that she didn't like what she saw, insanely cackling. Whoa, we're losing her. Luke goes out to a nightclub in search of some kind of connection, standing off on the side by himself looking out of place. It seems some girl across the room catches his attention, and he makes his move, approaching her amongst the strobing lights. He starts getting overwhelmed in the strobes, and collapses, hearing strange voices, 
and sees monsters in place of people standing over him, causing him to wail in horror. Based on this incident alone, it's clear that Luke has some serious social anxiety. He probably has since he was a kid, but it has grown more severe over time. With the doctor, he reveals the true root of his concern, that he is going to wind up becoming just like his mother. But Braun encourages that it's common for people to see things that aren't real, and there are meds to help him out. He inquires if he's seen things like this before, and he does admit to having had an imaginary friend as a kid, who he calls his only friend, really. So he's also incredibly lonely as well, and that will, of course, take a toll on anyone's well-being. Luke beats himself up further, calling his friendship with Daniel pathetic. But Bronn sees the potential benefits. Perhaps we should not be afraid of our imagination, and in fact, this could be a good opportunity to reconnect with that part of himself again. Walking absentmindedly down the street, he has a chance encounter with a girl on her skateboard, causing her to crash. She awkwardly apologizes, and she's frustrated, telling him sarcastically to have a lovely day while he collects his sandwiches. Unable to sleep, he converses with his childhood stuffed animal and cannot handle the loneliness anymore. He enters the other room, seeing the dollhouse there. He uncovers it after all these years, noticing the lights are still on downstairs. He digs through the desk drawers and finds the key in one, allowing him to let Daniel be free once more. Luke is later startled awake to the sound of glass shattering and sees his mom downstairs muttering and walking through the shards, cutting her feet. She stomps upstairs, walking right by him and holes up in the bathroom. She insists that she's fine, but he doesn't agree, busting the door down to get to her. He finds her hands covered in blood, shrieking, I can't look at that face. There's a third party in the room with him. Daniel there, chilling in the tub. He's back. Luke gives her a concerned glance and she fires back, don't look at me like you're any different. He tells her that she can't stay here anymore, bringing the scissors to her throat. Daniel chimes in, suggesting that he put the blade on his own. Let go or kill me, he growls, and she finally drops the scissors. Through tears, they hug and Luke promises to get her some help. Sitting amongst the broken glass, Daniel joins Luke, who admits to being surprised that he was even still around. Dan sighs, well, he needed his help, and Luke starts getting upset. His pal tries to cheer him up, doing a parachute opening mime thing that they did as kids. Cleaning up later, Daniel steps in with a broom blade, hopeful to play like before. But Luke is focused on the reality and applying to law school. Dan is taken aback, wondering what happened to him. As a kid, he was bursting with imagination. Luke shuts him down. You know what happened. There's a surprise visitor at the door. Skateboard girl Cassie, who it turns out accidentally has his wallet. He tries to offer her a reward, which he turns down. However, when Daniel suggests that he stay insistent, she finally gives in and takes the cash, saying she'll think of him when buying some art supplies. And Dan tells him to say he's an artist too, stammering that he does photography sometimes. Total lie, apparently. She notices the blood everywhere, and he explains that his mom had an accident. She callously asks, what, with a chainsaw? And quickly apologizes, asking if she's gonna be okay. Dan coaches him to act vulnerable, which works aces, getting invited to an art show opening. Hey, maybe Daniel's encouragement is all Luke really needed after all. But on the way there later, Luke is already getting overwhelmed, Dan assuring him that that was only because he wasn't there before. He comes to Cassie in the middle of a heated argument, which Dan tells him to try and defuse, despite Luke not feeling confident. He almost gets a bottle in the face, but she stops herself, Cassie complaining that the place is full of lame-ass posers. She walks off, asking him to tag along. As she talks further, she seems quite jaded, saying all real artists are either dead or broke, so she has to deal with these trust fund assholes. Dan draws his attention to a particular painting, and Cassie opens up that it's her father. Luke gives it a compliment that she calls sweet. Dan nods for him to make a move, but she pulls away and weirdly decides to destroy her entire art display. Luke gets out his camera to capture the moment, thanks to Dan's suggestion, and the two band together to rip the whole thing to shreds. Dan gets excited at the destruction, hopping up and down, demanding more, more, more. Talking over things later, Luke is worried that he is unable to keep up with her, while Dan believes that he's been living in a mental prison. He needs to get out and live. He scoffs, are you here to just give me pep talks? Dan clarifying, I'm here because of you. He laughs, calling himself insane. But Dan thinks he's not insane, rather he's truly awake. Their friendship grows stronger, and it really does seem like Dan is helping Luke in his life and issues in a lot of ways. In class, he appears stressed out taking a test, but luckily Dan 
man steps out and removes his shirt, revealing the answers he needs written all over his body. They play a prank on his roommate Richard, waking him up with a mask that freaks him out good. The reaction sending the boys into fits of giggles. They show up to another party, but unlike before, Luke has Dan as backup, already boasting that he can get any girl's number in here. And with a few Cyrano-esque lines from Dan, Luke is able to have some monochrome of game and easily wins the girl Sophie's number. However, there's already a slight derangement to Dan's demeanor, kind of pushing things to excess and commands Luke to keep drinking despite him already being wasted. He ultimately elects to fuck it and drinks even more, leading to some heavy petting with Sophie on the couch, Dan watching on with a blank stare of satisfaction. I did this. After tossing his cookies, Luke plunges into a liquor-fueled slumber. Dan tries to poke him to no response, so he takes advantage of his moment of weakness. He takes Luke's hand, grabbing a straight razor with it, and puts it right up to his throat. Dan says in a weird voice, drop it or kill me, mommy. Luke comes to before anything can happen, even Dan looking a bit confused by what just happened. The influence of Dan and how it has changed Luke is clear. He even compliments him on his newfound passion for photography, and Luke describes himself as just trying to connect with people, you know, empathy and stuff. He goes out with Cassie, and they randomly break into a school and rifle through the library. Thanks to Dan's assistance, he's able to look like he knows all the books verbatim, as he's actually reading over Cassie's shoulder. She can't help but be impressed, calling him a super brain. When they turn to the Bible, Dan does a fiery quote from Exodus, but Luke doesn't follow his direction this time, reciting a dirty limerick instead. Dan only gets more animated, getting right in Luke's face, spitting there is no other god before me. Cassie can seem to sense there is something different about Luke, saying he seems like he always has an inside joke going in his head all the time. He shows off his photos to her, and she reveals that he is the inspiration to her latest work, saying that he deserves to be immortalized. Dan, feeling left out, corrects, we deserve to be immortalized. The work is complete, and Luke is struck by something she put in the background that sort of resembles horns or antlers of some kind. She refers to it as his shadow, something full of danger and mystery, though she can't actually see Dan like he does. They think sometimes maybe being crazy isn't so bad, leading right into them hopping in bed together. Again, Dan watching the whole thing unfold with a glazed, lifeless demeanor. While it might appear so far Daniel has been helping Luke, his more sinister, destructive nature starts soon rearing its head. Sophie and a friend unexpectedly show up right at a party, Sophie calling Luke a freak to his confusion. Turns out that she and Dan have been texting, which implies there are times when maybe Luke is asleep, that Dan is in the driver's seat, so to speak. Luke is uncomfortable with the whole situation, but Dan encourages him, these are your friends now, and this is what you do. Seeing no other option, they do some lines and drink while Richard rambles on about the upcoming apocalypse. And we see Dan is not a fan of this guy. Richard also has the bright idea to wander around a bunch of tunnels under the campus, and Sophie and Luke break off on their own. She pointedly asks if he ever feels like he's hiding his true self, making a new identity to cover who you are. He smirks, I guess. He does have a voice in his head that tells him to do things. That darkness seems to be enticing to her, calling it what she sees as his animalistic side, and goes to make a move, but he rebuffs her. Dan is annoyed, thinking that it must be guilt over Cassie, and Luke asks for a second. Dan confronts him with a worrisome proposition. It's not cheating if it's me asking to take over completely. Before he even gets a chance to answer, Dan puts his hands on his neck, and his face starts melting off in a bunch of flesh tendrils. The two fuse together and assumedly switch places, with Dan now in control. Probably what he's really wanted the whole time. The change is immediately obvious, Luke going for a line and right into getting down with Sophie. Luke, this time, watches on, unable to do anything, as Dan, in his body, keeps plowing away. He does try to reach a hand out to attempt to do anything. As he gets closer, his hand snaps off disturbingly. The deed done, Sophie shows off a picture of him, telling him that he looks good, but Dan is perturbed, seeing that it is still Luke's face, not his own. With very bad timing, Richard comes stumbling in, and since Dan doesn't like him, unleashes his rage upon him, beating him up and burning his face on a pipe. Sophie stops the mayhem with a lawn chair to the back, wondering what the hell is wrong with him. This all leads to some very real consequences as Luke is kicked out of school. But Dan argues, in fact, that he has freed him. Now all Luke wants is to be rid of his friend, but it's not that simple. Dan only laughing when he tries to count down from three to make him go away. So he attempts to get him to go back into the dollhouse, but Dan is unbothered, chiding he can't put him in there because he's crazy. Dan assumes his mom's voice. All of your delusions, he says, brandishing her infamous scissors from earlier. So 
he visits his mom at the care facility in hopes of answers, mentioning that she was put in the same room she had before. It sounds like these issues have plagued her most of her life, even detailing a time in college when she tried to burn down a radio station because she was convinced that the DJs were making fun of her. He presses her if she knew that he might suffer similar problems as her, but she's adamant that she did not. She always hoped whatever happened was due to his father leaving. So again, he didn't really have any problems before that happened and Daniel first came into his life. These revelations cut to Luke's core and he begins shaking. She tries to call for help and orderlies instead drag her away. And well, it looks like he's on his own to figure this thing out. Well, not exactly alone as Daniel is always there behind him, just like a shadow as Cassie said. He does what he can to try and put his life back together, but it doesn't go so well. He attempts to apologize to Sophie, which ends with him getting pepper sprayed. Not good. And with Dr. Braun, he takes him to task that he must take responsibility for what he did as Daniel is a part of his mind. At this point, he is convinced he is full blown schizophrenic and Daniel is a product of his troubled mind. Luke cries to the doc that he's just like his mother, but Daniel disagrees. He's something much more interesting. Again, when passed out, Dan makes another move, opening his mouth and peering inside. He wakes up shouting at others in the library to leave him alone. Everyone staring on aghast and confused. Luke gets some prescription meds, which Dan warns him not to take or risk saying goodbye to your photos and your women. Undeterred, he takes the pill right away and Dan starts choking, tumbling to the floor dramatically and is suddenly motionless. Luke cautiously reaches out to touch him and Dan snaps up, appearing behind him, laughing about the shocked look on his face. Not gonna be that easy, boyo. We're back at the swirling cosmos, spliced with haunting imagery and then see a newspaper headline come into focus regarding that opening coffee shop shooting, learning that the gunman was killed in a standoff with police. Luke awakening from the nightmare. Perhaps there is some kind of connection here and amongst his mom's many papers uncovers the same news article. Daniel beaming, that was quite a spectacle. All that blood. He's able to track down the kid John's father, thinking that he must be similar in some way to Luke. His dad fills him in on the boy's troubled history. They did try to help him and got him medicated, yet it only worked temporarily. The only thing that ever seemed to calm him down were his drawings, offering Luke to see them himself. As soon as he leaves the room, Percy goes right to phone the police. One drawing features two people, one on top of a rocky structure, with lines again like horns coming out of his head. He asks if John ever heard voices or anything, his dad suggesting to take a moment, but he expresses his concern that what happened to his son is now happening to him. He has more disturbing and illuminating pictures, a dark figure and another playing swords just like Dan and Luke did, and one guy with a shadow guy behind him. Luke puts the connection together. The same guy on the castle must have been Daniel, meaning they both had him as a friend at some point. Dan tries to get him moving. You know, the cops are on their way and Luke realizes that he was with John until he was with him. Right, so now we understand Daniel is not truly an imaginary friend, but more like a sinister demonic force. This is what led John to the coffee shop shootout. And when he died as a result, Daniel went in search of a new friend, landing on Luke who happened to be by the bloody crime scene. That's what we saw happen earlier. He tries to explain everything to Cassie, who is surprisingly even willing to listen to him at this point, but his crazed ramblings about being worried about killing people is definitely freaking her out. He brings up the shadow from the drawing that she made, but she describes it as just being a metaphor, a darkness that we all have. This causes him to lose it, flinging a table, and she screeches for him to get out, pushing him out of her place. Well, there's only one person left to turn to, his doctor, who agrees to meet him at his mother's apartment. Daniel already telling him he'll regret this. Luke completely Explains that the pills don't work and the doc fills him in there are other approaches they can try. He explains how a mind tends to reflect one's own environment and this was his world when this all started. So he wants to hear what this Daniel has to say. Utilizing a Tibetan singing bowl and a dagger to pierce illusions, he decides to hypnotize them both in an attempt to engage with this delusion, asking if he's here. Luke says, of course, he's always here, telling him all kinds of nasty stuff. He clangs on the cup and begins their session. Fear and loneliness are some of the most powerful emotions humans can experience. These can grow inside until they rule our every thought, although the mind will do anything to avoid confronting just how alone it is in the universe. While that definitely sounds like a lot of what Luke is going through, plus the demon guy, he first speaks to Luke, asking him to follow the sound of his voice, then turns his attention to Daniel directly, Luke beginning to groan and writhe when he does. He keeps trying and trying, Luke convulsing and his eyes darting. Surprisingly, it works, and after saying, he wants to talk. Daniel appears right next to him asking, about what? And Dan confronts what the doctor suspected about Luke. 
He's weak, lonely, and nothing without me. The doc can for sure see him, wanting to know just who he is. Dan refers to himself as a traveler, searching for a home. Sounds like he wants a body, and it seems that he's found what he's looking for, prying Luke's mouth open, warning this is gonna be painful, and really starts stretching his face out. He carves a gaping hole into his torso, big enough for him to crawl right inside of, all snug and sound in his new meat suit. The change in demeanor is immediately obvious. Luke, really Daniel, looking back to the doc with a playful stare. He tells the doctor that he's feeling better now and lunges. And after a brief struggle, he gets him with a knife. Luke goes absolutely batshit, stabbing him repeatedly in demented glee. Other Luke wakes up aghast. Did that really happen? Afraid so, buddy. And even more alarmingly, this Luke, the real Luke, has found himself at that gate between worlds represented by the dollhouse. He comes to a mirror, seeing the horned creature around the corner, which must be Daniel's true form. He sees it in the mirror, and it gets closer, croaking, I am the abyss. It repeatedly commands for him to get in, a single tear streaming down Luke's face, and he doesn't utter a word. Just as Luke did when they were kids, Daniel has done a classic switcheroo here, and now it's Luke that is trapped in the house. Man, you got tricked good, and this must have been Daniel's real intent the entire time to get a body of his own. He kept trying to get at him over and over like when he was passed out drunk and stuff, but since he was hypnotized, he had a full chance to finally get him. Daniel quickly embraces his new body and throws out Luke's old life, getting rid of his pills and stomping all over his precious photographs. He gives himself a full Daniel-style makeover, oh yeah, that slicks back real nice, and practices a devilish-looking smile in the mirror. You can tell he's really excited doing a little kick twirl on the way out of the suit store. I don't know, anyone else getting some uh, Bully Maguire vibes over here? Uh, the idea is kind of the same when you think about it. He, of course, next pays Cassie a visit, trying to convince her that he's doing better now. Once again, kind of shocked she even let him in at this point, but she understands that he is struggling and can't get rid of his shadow. Daniel thinks otherwise. We should not get rid of our shadows. In fact, they should rule. Again, clearly his whole thing here. She suspects something is off, reaching for a box cutter, while Luke fumbles his way around the otherworldly castle. Another creature is there with a thorny face and chases after him, but shouts for him to wait. So maybe it actually isn't trying to kill him. He makes his way to a kind of display room, seeing things amongst the items like medieval looking helmets, a dagger with fresh blood, probably the one used on Braun, and some good old fashioned firearms, including a shotgun that must have belonged to Josh. I'm assuming this is Daniel the Creature's kind of trophy room tied to various lives that he's claimed over the years. The massive scary painting featuring him eating a dude seems to back all this up. Daniel loses his cool veneer with Cassie, deciding he's had enough of this facade. He reaches out his face and starts peeling it off like Play-Doh, rearranging it into Daniel's. In the other house, the phone starts to ring, and Luke can hear Cassie screaming in terror. Here we see a substantial change in Luke's personality. Knowing Cassie is in danger, he finally is able to have the motivation that he needs to be proactive on his own, without Daniel, importantly. When coming to another locked door, he's able to actually construct a key in his hand. The moment of triumph is quickly dashed, though, as on the other side of the door is only a brick wall, another dead end. He spins back to Thornface there snarling, and Luke reactively stabs him. He realizes this was a mistake, and that it was actually John Thingpin, the coffee shop killer kid. Sounds like Daniel must have pulled the same trick on John as he did with Luke, and was able to take over his body in the real world. Must be where the whole massacre at the coffee shop comes in. As Daniel himself says, he preys on weak and lonely people. This makes it easier to play the friend slash mentor role, because a lot of times that's all anyone needs. Just another voice of support, you know? Which makes it pretty much a cakewalk for Daniel to manipulate them into getting whatever he wants. Pretty evil dude. So John wound up here trapped as Daniel took his body, and even when he died, he's still stuck in the castle. Sucks too that you also get turned into a monster over time. What is that all about? He wants to know what's outside the castle, and John groans the abyss before bleeding out. He starts pulling away at the bricks and removes enough to make his way through. He comes out on the outside of the structure, and right over the side is that same cosmic abyss looming below. This must be the connection point between these two worlds, as Luke is able to actually hear Cassie yelling out for him through it, hopeful that he's still in there. He catches his breath and takes a leap of faith right
right into the swirling colors. It does work, and Luke makes it back to our world, finding Dan has Cassie trapped on the rooftop. Luke sees that he's a parasite, but Dan counters he's been helping people for hundreds of years, but no one appreciates it. You're the parasite, he cries. Cassie makes a break for it, and when Dan turns away, Luke launches a pole that goes right through him. The two grab brooms that turn into swords, hearkening back to their childhood imagination days, and it's time for a rooftop showdown between the two. Though it is a bit one-sided, Dan quickly takes control and blocks every one of Luke's attacks. They get their blades intertwined, and Dan overpowers Luke, slashing him in the shoulder. Luke pushes him off and keeps weakly keeping him at bay. Dan puts an end to it, butting him with the back of his blade repeatedly. Luke boldly declares, if you go, I go. But Dan doesn't think he's strong enough. Luke grabs him and leaps off the building, seeing them as kids and their broom hitting the ground. Luke crashes into the ground, leaving him in a bloody heap on the concrete. But it was a heroic sacrifice, at least. Stop Daniel from killing more people. And wasn't that kind of the whole point that he was too much of a wiener to do anything? Well, look at what he did now, all by himself. Hey, pretty impressive, actually. Sorry about dying. Cassie rushes to his side, but has to accept that he's already gone, lying sullenly on her back on the concrete. As for Daniel, he's back in his weird castle looking kind of pissed. The lights flicker over his face, catching glimpses of his true form, which takes over permanently. He steps outside, staring off into the abyss and leaps. Things end here, and the assumption is that Daniel is able to come into the real world in his true form, which is a frightening thought. But I gotta wonder, why didn't he try that before? Seems a lot easier than the whole trick people into taking their bodies and trapping them in the castle thing, you know what I mean? Maybe he didn't know he could just jump through the abyss until Luke did, or maybe he's just really pissed off, less interested in trickery, but now just wants to spread some evil. With that, we have reached the conclusion of this ending explained for Daniel Isn't Real. Don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Daniel Isn't Real and its ending? What's your interpretation of what goes down? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.